I'm reading from Luke chapter 9, the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. And now I have to find Luke chapter 9. You know, it's quite remarkable. I don't care how well you know your Bible, but when you have to find a particular book of the Bible, you never quite know where on earth it is. Um, reading from Luke chapter 9 and verse 21 to 27, there are different passages we're going to read. So Luke chapter 9 verse 21. Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And he said to them, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day he will raise to life. Then he said to them, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and let you lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I'll tell you the truth. There's some who are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And then we move on to verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And then we move over to chapter 14. Chapter 14 and verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and returning and turning to them, he said, if anyone wants to come to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if, it has in, if he has enough money to complete it. For if he lays a foundation and he's not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him. And they will say, this fellow began to build, was not able to finish. Well, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him, the 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other still is a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. The same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? He's neither fit for the soil, or for the manure heap. It is to be thrown out. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. From the start of Jesus' ministry, he seems to be surrounded by, by people. Later in his ministry, 
those attracted to him were called the multitudes. When he recorded, when he fed the crowd, it's recorded there were 5,000 men there. Who knows what the actual number was? Because it doesn't include the women or the children. Sometimes in Scripture we read that there's a multitude with them. Sometimes we read there was a great multitude. I don't know what the difference was, but all I know is that there were a lot of people when it says that. Now, a lot of people came to Jesus for a whole lot of reasons. There were those who came out of sheer curiosity. I mean, we hear of a new church opening up every now and then, and, you know, suddenly we say, oh, let's go and just check it out, you know. It's just curiosity. Let's see how things happen in this other church. We do that. People do that. Some came to speak because they wanted to see his miracles. People like, love a great show. They really do. And so some came for that. Some, some people would have come to listen to Jesus because somehow when he spoke, his words resonated within their spirits. Somehow his words seemed to give their spirit life. And they, they needed to hear and experience the life that Jesus came there were others. There were others who followed him because they thought he was the promised Messiah. And that, you know, if he's the prom promised Messiah and if he will throw, overthrow the Romans and if he's going to sit on the throne, well, then I better make sure I'm pretty close to him in any case. And so they came along. Simple political reasons. But we read also in Scripture, for all these multitudes... Um, Luke, who wrote the same gospel, um, tells us that at the time of Pentecost, there were about 120 people who really followed him. But from these whole multitudes, there are only 120 who really follow him. And in fact, of those 120, only 12 were disciples. Now, now, I think that's indicative of the tendency we find in the church. There are a whole lot of followers in the church. There are a whole lot of people who really come to church regularly. But there are very few who really are very close and very involved. It's life. It's always like that. It's in every club you meet, go to, it's in every committee that you have. That's the way it is. A lot of people just floating around there and very few people really committed. Twice in Luke's Gospel, when Jesus is teaching these crowds, he talks about discipleship. In Luke 9.23, he says, If you want to come with me, you must forget yourself, take up your cross every day, and follow me. For if you want to save your life, you will lose it, but if you lose your life for my sake, you will save it. In Luke 14, he says the same kind of thing. He says, Those who come to me cannot be my disciple unless they love me more than they love father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters themselves as well. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. So twice Jesus talks, and he's recorded in Luke's Gospel, talking to the people about discipleship and about carrying their cross. One statement is positive. If you want to come with me, you must forget yourself, and <clears throat> no, you must forget yourself, take up your cross every day, and follow me. And one is in the negative. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Taking up one's cross, well, that, that means embarking on a road that will mean the death of you. That's what it means. Sounds very dramatic. The more I think about life, 
the more I think life is just like that. I think it's, I think it's a normal thing in life, this, this all what Jesus is talking about. And we all walk that road. You know, children, children give up a relatively carefree life to enter the confines of school so they can be educated. They do it. They give up, well, we actually force them to, but they give up one way of life for another way of life. Later, children grow up, and it's not always the case, but most, percent, most of them kind of leave this easy, carefree life of school to become further educated, to enter the environment of work, to build a career, to become financially secure. They do it. And they don't do it with a, with a fight. In fact, most people, by the time they've in, finished matric, want to leave school. They want to put a death to that life. They want to get on and do other things. They want to go to university. They can drink at university and they can't do it at school. You have to understand it. It's true, I'm telling you. If, if you think children go to school, to university to learn, you're deceiving yourself, okay? You, it's, it's a bit of a deception that it's not entirely quite true. Then something happens in a person's life, and they, it, it happened at quite a late stage in my life, at about 30, where you've been living this nice, carefree life, and just, you know, you have this girlfriend, and you have another girlfriend, and you have a just, you're just generally enjoying life without too much of a commitment other than work. And then you meet somebody, and something kind of changes, and, and you give up that carefree life. Not everybody does, I promise you. But you kind of want to give up that carefree life to, to live a life committed with another person. So you kind of put to death that carefree life. And, and then parents reach this remarkable stage where, well, not parents, married couples reach this mar remarkable stage where they kind of they're kind of free. They don't have any problems, eh? They really don't. They they, they can go to bed at ten o'clock and wake up at six o'clock and it's quite cool. They can do that. Um, and then they take this decision, sometimes they don't, it just happens, but they have children. And then they go to a life where for a few years they just don't get sleep at all. It doesn't happen. I mean the wedding and Eugene you know how hyperactive he is. Well, you must know what he was like as a baby. He didn't sleep a night for about the first five years. But I think he might be a bit calmer now. But people do that. People actually put to death a way of life so they can embark on another way of life. It's normal. And in fact, if they don't do that, we think there's something wrong with them. So I want to ask the question, what's, what's the problem we have with taking up your cross daily and following Jesus? It's a part of the normal rhythm of life. That is how it is. We put to there something and we move on to something else in life that can bring more meaning and more purpose and add depth to our life. We all do it. It's a natural phenomenon. Now that's what Jesus is actually saying. He's saying to be, that's the road you need to walk in life. He's saying that. But there's a difference here. Because Jesus calls us in a sense that's another dimension to life. He calls us to a more profound more difficult, more challenging way of life. 
is he calls us to be different to others. Do not be like the world. He calls us to be different about others. And to be different means we need to think different. That's what it implies. And essentially how I understand discipleship in my life now, where I am now, for me, discipleship is a profound challenging of the way I think because my actions will not weigh, change until my way of thinking has changed. The way you think is the way you act. We all know that. So the challenge to me, if I want to change how I do things, I need to change up here. My thinking has to change. And so I'm reaching that stage where, where I need to question the most basic paradigms of myself and the world in which I live in the light of the promises of God, in the light of the Word of God, in the light of, of the Torah, I need to do it. I need to take those most basic paradigms that result in the way I do things and weigh them up against what Scripture says and the way of Christ is. I need to do that. And I know that is the only way to break the chains of my mind. And so I'm beginning to ask questions about the most basic paradigms upon which my life is based. And I'm finding that these paradigms actually are sacrosanct in a lot of ways. The way of the thinking, they're sacrosanct. There's something called rationalism. We all believe in it. Things have to, to be a rational argument. There has to be rationality in, in the way things happen and the way we think. If it's not rational, we call it illogical. But where in rationality and how does God fit into that? How? Because what Christ calls us to is not rational. There's a question, Mark, in my mind about the, the emphasis we place on rationality. You know, the very argument against God is based on two things. Rationalism, it does not make sense, and empiricism, that there has to be proof for everything. I'm questioning both. My God can't fit into rational minds. He can't be limited by our ability to understand. He cannot be limited by that. My God, my God can't be reduced to some kind of observation and the formulating of the results of that observation. He can't be reduced to that. That's empiricism. We base so much on what we think and what we can see, what we can define, what we can measure, and what we can include from it. Now you fit God into that equation. Doesn't fit. The other things. I've got a major question mark against commercialism, consumerism. You know, a while ago, I was in Wales, I was watching some TV, and it was at the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, now, the people watching TV at 9 o'clock in the morning are not people who are working age, okay? Now, either are they people at school age, although that's not always the case, but they shouldn't be in that kind of 
So people, I don't know how to say this nicely, but people watching TV at 9 o'clock in the morning are most probably pretty elderly people, okay. They, they are. So I'm watching this thing on TV, eh? And, and there's this advert at 9 o'clock in the morning on you must buy this machine because if you buy this machine, you will get ironing board abs. Now, who in the age group who watches TV at that time wants to get ironing board abs? I don't know. I mean, do you? I mean, if, if I take half the people here, do you want to do the exercise and say your stomach can be a lot flat like mine, you know, this kind of ab? Do you want it? Of course not. So why are they trying to sell that to you? You see, the only way consumerism can work is if you can get people to buy what they don't need. There's no other way it can work. And so they spend billions of rands to convince you through advertising you need an ad machine at the age of 75. It's, it's absurd. Our whole economy is based on consumerism. Getting people to buy what they don't need. Now, I've got a fundamental question mark about that. About the morality about getting people to buy what they don't need. And so playing with their minds that they do it. There is something fundamentally immoral about that. And you know it because when people phone you to sell you a new insurance policy or a new cell phone deal, you kind of tell them you're not interested. So we, we kind of know this. The other assholes. You know, we all say that we, are, we have to be democratic. Well, if democracy can produce a Donald Trump, then I think it's failed. It has, <laughs> I'm saying democracy cannot work in all scenarios. It cannot work. There's a whole lot of things that, that we actually believe to be san san sacrosanct that are highly problematic. The, the international economic system, which is based in, on capitalism, 90% of the wealth is in the hands of 10% of the people. How can that be morally right? But these are the things we base our thinking on. We don't question how they weigh up against what we believe in God. We don't even think about questioning it. I'm saying discipleship, you need to start moving to those areas and raising those questions in your own mind about what the world thinks is so sacrosanct and you say to yourself, how, how does this which the world says is so sacrosanct, how, how does that weigh up against what I believe and against my Bible and the way of life God calls me to? And so we call to question these ba basic things, premises, behind all the limitations there are in this world, behind the premises of psychology and all those things. We need to question our basic premises about community life. We need to question about who we are. And how do we as Christians fit into these things? We need to question. And people don't realize how ingrained these most basic paradigms are within us, how profoundly they actually affect our thinking, how profoundly they affect what we do and how we do it. There's a basic flaw in everything. I remember years ago, um, 
There is, there is a guy, a, a bishop, he recently died rec recently. And Ernest Bartman, I, I really, I really love that man. He, is, he started the black consciousness movement and the black struggle and black theology and all that kind of thing. He is, he's an activist. And he really paid an incredible price for it in his life. Um, and one day, when I was in Queenstown, he was visiting and we had lunch together. And he was in the house there. And the arms deal corruption had just kind of blown up. And I asked him, I said, Ernest, you paid such a price to, yeah, you paid such a price for everybody to be free in this country, to get the vote. And, and we do that. We end up, we end up with this arms corruption, deal corruption. How, how do you feel about giving up so much in your life, spending so much energy fighting something that gets replaced by the kind of corruption we have? How, how do you feel about it? And Ernest said to me, he said, Philip, you must always, you always treated me like, like a little child. Um, he would kind of sometimes put his arm around me and say, Flip, you need to understand this. It's like I was a little child that needed to, to be taught. And he put his arm around me and he said to me, Philip, you must always remember that behind all the great thinking and all the great philosophies and all the great systems, and all the great structures of this world, behind all of that are human beings who were born in sin and are sinners. He says they will always be profoundly flawed because it is human beings who are limited. Sin will always mark them because it was sinners they gave birth to them. <laughs> That's profound. But Jesus calls us to challenge those things. He calls us to challenge how they affect our thinking and how they affect our actions in ways we don't even see but are contrary to the way of God. I want to close with a poem, T.S. Eliot, in his poem, The Journey of the Magi, The, the Three Wise Men, he, he wrote this. He said, all this was a long time ago, I remember. I would do it again, but I would set this down. Set this down. This, were we led all that way for a birth or a death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I'd seen birth and death and thought they were different. But this birth was hard and difficult agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but we were no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an old people clutching their alien gods along for another death. Amen.